I want to begin my remarks by reading the very first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, the signing of which we are going to commemorate and celebrate in just a few days. The very first paragraph of the Declaration reads, When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. My message is entitled, When God Separates. When God Separates. Sometimes separation is not of God. Sometimes division and separation is the work of the evil one. But sometimes separation is the work of God. And I want to show you a few examples of that in the scriptures this afternoon. Take your Bibles first and turn with me to please to Genesis chapter 11. I want to give you just a few examples from the Bible as to when God separated people. When God was the author of separation. Genesis chapter 11 and verses 1 through 9. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they, be, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of of the earth. Here is the first occasion where God was the principal author of man's separation. In this particular instance, God separated the globalists from each other. What we have going on here is not simply a bunch of people getting together and wanting to build a tall building. God told Noah and his descendants after the flood that they were supposed to go forth into all the earth and replenish the earth. That was God's command to man. He had destroyed mankind in a great and universal flood. Only Noah, his wife, his children, and their wives escaped that judgment. And now from that one family, the earth was going to be repopulated. The command of God was to go forth into all the earth and replenish it. Here we find in Genesis chapter 11, just a few chapters after reading of the great flood in the book of Genesis, 
we find a, a gaggle of men. Men rebellious to the word and will of God. Men who did not want to do as God had said, to go throughout the earth and replenish the earth, but they wanted to bring all of their sources together so that they could make a idol unto themselves. They rejected the command of Jehovah God. They, they rejected the will of Jehovah God. And they wanted to create a worship and a religion of their own. In essence, ladies and gentlemen, the builders of Babel were idolaters. They worshipped a false god. They rejected the true and living God. And not only were they idolaters, they were the, the world's first globalists. Globalists have been with us ever since this attempt was made to build the city in the Tower of Babel. Globalists are people who are at their heart and at their soul idolaters. They have rejected the worship of the true and living God. They have rejected His Son, Jesus Christ. They have rejected the authority of the Word of God. They have rejected the preeminence of Almighty God as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And they wish to create a utopian society where that they themselves are God over men. They desire to bring all of mankind into submission to their authority. By nature, these men are rich. And by rich, I don't mean millionaires. By rich, I mean the men and women who are pretty much the controlling factors of what happens politically and economically among the world's great governments. They are the ones who are pulling the strings behind the scenes. They are the ones that for the most part are calling the shots. And if you wonder sometimes why things seem to be happening as they are, and you can't figure out how our politicians can be so stupid. Let me enlighten you. They are not stupid. They are controlled. And I'm sorry, but I have to ask this question, and I would love to ask this question of Mr. John Roberts himself. Sir, what are the skeletons in your closet? Have you ever noticed whenever there's a key vote that needs to be made, somebody will come up that you never expect and will be the deciding vote to bring whatever that legislation is into fruition? I don't know if there's anything in his closet that he doesn't want us to know about that would be an embarrassment to him or could even possibly end his career. I have no idea of knowing that. But I will guarantee you this. There are scores and hundreds of men and women in high office who do have skeletons in their closets and the people that are pulling the strings know where those skeletons are and they will use them to their advantage every time it's necessary. Globalists are those who manipulate the affairs of men, government and commerce in particular, in order to fulfill the machinations they have toward a global government. After all, if you were a very wealthy man and you wanted to have the ultimate power experience, 
If somehow or another you were able to get rid of the national boundaries and the laws and the rules and the regulations that govern commerce, think about how your profit margin could quadruple and beyond. Think of the power you could wield if somehow or another you would be able to melt or merge the nations of the world or at least, if nothing else, get rid of the constraints and restrictions that nationhoods provide relative to interstate commerce. It is all about money. It is all about power. It's all about the super elite and the super wealthy dictating those things which are going to make it easier for them to become the despots and dictators of the world that they so desire. At their heart and at their soul, they are idolaters. Many of these men in our government and other governments will take an annual trip to Mahimian Grove, California, and there, outside the view of cameras with no one allowed, and very few people even been able to sneak in, although there has been a couple that have been able to came, come out with some crude video of some of the shenanigans that those people participate in, and there, under the moonlight, under the stars, with the fire of Molech burning brightly in the night. Many of these world leaders are dancing naked around the fire, worshiping the Old Testament God of Molech. And many of them are Republicans as well as Democrats. Many of them call themselves Christians to the voting public. But they are filled with idolatry. They are filled with evil and sensuousness and adultery. They engage in the most despicable, heinous improprieties that you could ever imagine. In fact, the more immoral the person is, the easier it is for him to be accepted among the power elite. The one thing the power elite do not relish and really cannot ever trust is someone who is a moral human being. Those kind of people never make it into the power elite. Never. For one thing, they cannot be bribed because of the skeletons in their closets. And number two, because they are a conviction to those who are reprobate in their own personal conduct. And they would never be allowed in the inner circle. I'm telling you that what we see going on at the, in Genesis chapter 11 has been happening at various levels in our world ever since, including to this present hour. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. Just real quick, I want to show you this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what hath fellowship with Right, hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or the devil? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Wherefore, come out from among the, them, and, and be ye separate, be ye separate. Separation. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. And I and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This passage of Scripture is plainly discussing the mixture of, of Christians who would go into a house of idols and would worship 
idols, who would worship in a house of idols and would take that that Christian life and heart and would put it in a place of idolatry and would there worship idols in a house of idols. How can any professing Christian, whether he's in politics or not, how can any professing Christians bow the knee to idols? How can we do this? And yet, these men and women who profess to be Christians, and yet they are bowing to the idol of power, and the idol of wealth, and the idol of money, and the idol of popularity, and in the process of time are selling not only their soul, but our republic down the drain. How dare they? How could any Christian go to Bohemian Grove and dance naked in front of the devil? How could any Christian allow themselves to be bought by the powers of darkness? How could any Christian who says he knows the Lord, who says Christ is his Savior, how could he allow himself to be a pawn in the hands of those who are so wicked and who are so vile, bloodthirsty men, shedding innocent blood all over the world? When God separates, he separated the globalists from each other. He confounded their language. He wasn't ready for the world to become one world government. And let me tell you something. God is not going to allow a one world government to take place until He, Jesus, returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Only then... In the meantime, God will continue to stir the hearts of freedom-loving, God-fearing men and women in each and every society, in each and every generation that will rise in righteous protest against the efforts of globalists. And I'm here to tell you, and this is being recorded live, and that's fine. I want everybody to know Chuck Baldwin and the people of Liberty Fellowship swear no allegiance to the United Nations or to the New World Order under whatever banner it's called. You can't kill all of us. You cannot imprison all of us. You cannot silence all of us. As long as freedom burns bright in the hearts of men and women, there will always be opposition to those who would attempt to create this monstrosity, whether it be called the North American Union, the North American Community, or the New World Order, or, or whatever you call it, whatever the title is. God-fearing, freedom-loving men and women will never submit to it. When God separates... He separated the globalists from one another in the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11. The next one I want you to notice is back in the book of Genesis as well. Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. The story is found in verses 1 through 11. For sake of time, let me just give you a summary of what is taking place. God told Abram to leave his country and to leave his kinfolk and to go to a place that God would show him. He didn't even know where he was going. So some of you people ought to feel a little bit better today. <laughs> some of you don't know where you're going either. He said, leave your kin, leave your country, go to a place that I will tell thee of. And so he launches out. 
He left his he left his country, but he didn't leave all of his kinfolk. He took his nephew Lot with him. God told him to leave his kinfolk. But he took Lot, his nephew. You can read the story of how Abram and Lot were together. Both of these were rich men, that is to say well-to-do men, with a lot of cattle and a lot of servants, etc. And as you read toward the end of the passage, in verses 1 through 11, Verse 7, there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between thy herdmen and thy herdmen, for we're brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the right, the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If thou to go to the right, then I'll go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and he looked at Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. And what he saw there attracted him. And so Lot decided that he would go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he and Abram separated. The separation of Abram from Lot. God knew that Abram and Lot would not be able to dwell together. He knew that Lot did not share the same heart, the same dream, the same passion as did Abram. He knew that Lot would be a thorn in Abram's flesh. He would be a stumbling block to Abram. That's why he told him to leave him behind. But he took him anyway. And Abram and Lot became the stumbling block, the hindrance to Abram that God knew that he would be. Strife came between the two men and their servants, their herdmen, etc., to the point that they were going to be weakened to their enemies. The Perizzite and the Canaanite were in the land. They were the enemies of Abram and Lot. And the friction between Abram and Lot was causing a risk and a danger to all of them as they were vulnerable then to the enemies that were always marauding around them. So not only from a spiritual point of view, the difference between Abram and Lot and their, and their perspective and their heart, but also from a practical military point of view. It was dangerous for Lot and Abram's men to stay together. And so they needed to separate. And that's exactly what they did. Abram went about it very diplomatically, very kindly, of course. He gave Lot the choice as to which direction he wanted to go, and he would go the other way. We know which way Lot went, and we know what happened to Lot after he went to Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot became a judge in Sodom. He became an elected official in Sodom. Well, pray tell, what kind of deals and compromises did he have to make to get that position, I wonder? He had two daughters that were unmarried. You know the story how God sent the angel to Sodom and Gomorrah for the purpose of destroying those wicked cities and the cities round about, and I've been to that part of the world, I've seen where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be, and there are no longer, there's no longer any city there. Uh, God destroyed not just the uh, city itself, but He destroyed any possible uh, reoccupation of those areas. The angel came. You know the story. I'm not going to belabor you with it here today. 
finally Lot fled the city along with his two daughters, his two unmarried daughters. His married children chose to stay in Sodom. His wife started to leave. She turned around and looked back. It wasn't just a matter of a glancing, you know, a, a, a glance. She looked back with the idea of wanting to go back. God turned her to a pillar of salt. So Lot leaves with his two unmarried daughters. Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. The two girls, they think the whole world has been destroyed. They think all the men in the world have been destroyed. I mean, they saw Sodom and Gomorrah, all the cities around, destroyed by fire. They just assumed that the whole world's been burned up. So they come up with this plan. We got to do something. We got to, we got to bear children. So they came up with this plot to get the old man drunk, Lot, and then sleep with him. That's exactly what they did. And one of the girls bore a son who became the father of the Ammonites. And the other girl bore a son who became the father of the Moabites. And the Moabites and the Ammonites were two of the most dreaded lethal enemies that Israel ever had. All because Abram would not leave Lot at home. The separation that God told him he did not obey. God has himself created nationhood. God is the author of independent nationhood. We've already seen how God feels about the attempt of globalism in Genesis chapter 11. And now we see the distinction that God has made in the land of Israel in the Old Testament from the other nations of the world at that time. And the separation that God gave to the nation of Israel and the heart of Israel and the laws of Israel and the government of Israel and the traditions of Israel, the culture of Israel, was all distinct from the culture and the religion and the laws of the other nations of the world. And God was very clear through His servant Moses that these distinctions were to be arduously and jealously maintained. And when the nation of Israel got in trouble, it usually got in trouble when it allowed other nations to influence its own laws and actions and culture, etc. God divided the nations. God created nationhood. And out of families come nations. And in this particular case, the nation of the Moabites and the nation of the Ammonites from the carnal man lot. Sometimes God separates families. Sometimes it is the devil that separates families, to be sure. But sometimes God separates families. Whenever many of us answered the call of God to do what He called us to do, whether it was to move to Montana or whether it was to, to speak out on whatever the issues were that burned in our hearts, whether it was to get involved in a, in a 
in a cause, to, to join a, a movement, to assist whatever it was that we could see that was helping to restore the principles of honor and right and freedom and so forth in our land. So many of us experienced the separation of family. A husband, a wife, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle, a son, a daughter, who could not understand why we did what we did, who could not understand our heart, who could not understand our vision, our goal, our dreams, who maybe even said we were extremists or radicals. There are people I know in the Patriot Movement whose families have disowned them because of their political and moral stands. And when I say disown them, I mean have cut them out of their inheritance who have said, I no longer have a son named so-and-so. I no longer have a daughter named so-and-so. If you're going to act that way, if you're going to believe that way, I want nothing more to do with you. We're talking about flesh and blood. Sir, if you have a wife who sees and understands what you see and understand and is willing to stand by your side at all costs, you should thank God for her. Because not all men have a wife like that. And ma'am, if you have a husband who understands what you understand and his eyes are opened as yours are and he knows what's going on in the world and he's not afraid to take a stand for these things that you know to be right, you should thank God for that husband because not every wife has such a man. Amen. If you have parents that understand, thank God for them. If you have children that understand, thank God for them because not everybody does. God sometimes separates families. The video that we're going to see today does not depict this, but if you go back and read your history, you will discover that on the eve of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, or should I say the vote on the Declaration of, of Independence, would have been on Jan, uh, July the 2nd. So that would have been on, on the evening of July the 1st. Benjamin Franklin, the sage of the founders in his 80s, a man that was about to become an outlaw to the British crown by signing that document, went to his son's home who was an ardent loyalist. And the history that I've read of that event says that Benjamin Franklin and his son stayed up all night long. Benjamin Franklin imploring, beseeching, begging his son to support independence and the break with Great Britain. And his son, a loyalist to the end, refused to support independence and said he would no longer support his father and that he would support the British crown and that when the break came that he would be on the side of the British against the colonists. 
Men, they left as the dawn broke on July the 2nd, 1776. Bryn Franklin, with a heavy heart, knowing that he was about to go sign the Declaration of Independence and that his own son would be a, an enemy. And I've read two historical he, he, uh, two historical uh, uh, references to what happened later. S some histor historians say that he never saw his son again. Other I read one, at least one historian who said that he thinks that he may have, met, may have met his son over in Great Britain years later after independence was won. Either way, an awful separation took place in the Franklin home on the night of July the 1st, 1776. Sometimes God separates families. In Exodus chapter 12, we have the separation of Israel from Egypt. Exodus chapter 12. You know the story. God sent Moses back to Egypt. Let my people go. Pharaoh said no. The plagues came. Finally at the end, Pharaoh and the others said, Get out of Dodge. Leave us. Take anything you want with you. And they took jewelry and precious metals and wealth galore and they separated from Egypt. This is the separation of those who would live in liberty from those who would live in tyranny. You know, this may shock some of you, but not everyone wants to live in freedom. Some people prefer servitude. They prefer slavery. They would rather have government being the all wise, all benevolent provider of everything they could ever want or ask. If they have to give up their freedoms, their liberties, if they have to give up their firearms, their freedom of speech, their freedom to assemble, their freedom to protest, their, their freedom to be free of unwanted, unlawful searches and seizures, etc., they'll gladly trade all of that in order to have the security that tyranny offers. Not everyone wants to live in freedom. Freedom is hard work, ladies and gentlemen. Freedom is dangerous, risky business. Freedom requires personal responsibility, personal accountability. It requires effort. It requires courage, strength, fortitude. Sometimes it even costs us our lives. And not everyone wants liberty. That was the case well, let me just give you one verse. Leviticus 25.10 Moses said, And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land under the inhabitants thereof. Read Jeremiah chapter 34 verses 8 and verses 15 through 17 when you get a chance. And you'll see the emphasis that God gave to Moses and to the prophets relative to the, to the issue of liberty and how that liberty was the underlying, undergirding theme of everything that God wanted to do in Israel since the day that He delivered them from bondage. The separation of those who want to live in freedom versus those who want to live in tyranny. And ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what happened. 
on July 2nd and July 4th, 1776, when our forebears signed that immortal document that we know as the Declaration of Independence. They were saying to the world, we no longer will live without liberty. And we are willing to separate ourselves from everything and everyone who is willing to live in tyranny. Make up your mind. Choose the side of the line that you are on. Either live in freedom or live in tyranny. But make up your mind and ask for me, as Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. I want to at this point give the little background of the story of the Declaration of Independence. When I conclude this background, we'll have to say goodbye to the internet audience. And again, I'm so sorry for that. But we cannot do anything else. But I, stay with me here. Let me read this background information. It will help you, I think, better appreciate what we are celebrating on Wednesday. And for those of us in this audience, it'll help you to better understand the video that you're about to see. I quote one historical source. While political maneuvering was setting the stage for an official declaration of independence, a document explaining the decision was being written. On June 11, 1776, Congress appointed a committee of five consisting of John Adams, of Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, Robert Livingston of New York, and Roger Sherman of Connecticut to draft a declaration. Because the committee left no minutes, there's some uncertainty about how the drafting process proceeded. Accounts written many years later by Jefferson and Adams have been frequently cited. What is certain is that the committee, after discussing the general outline that the document should follow, decided that Jefferson should write the first draft. The committee in general, and Jefferson in particular, thought Adams should write the document. But Adams persuaded the committee to choose Jefferson and promised to consult with Jefferson personally. Considering Congress's busy schedule, Jefferson probably had limited time for writing over the next 17 days and likely wrote the draft quickly. He then consulted with others, made some changes, and then produced another copy incorporating these alterations. The committee presented this copy to the, to the Congress on June 28, 1776. The title of the document was A Declaration by the Representatives of the United States of America and General Congress Assembled. Congress ordered that the draft lie on the table for two days, Congress methodically edited Jefferson's primary document, having reduced the writing by one-fourth, removed unnecessary wording, and improved sentence structure. Congress removed Jefferson's assertion that Britain had forced slavery on the colonies, which it had, in order to moderate the document and appease persons in Britain who supported the revolution. Although Jefferson wrote that Congress had mangled his draft version, the declaration was finally produced, and according to his biographer, John Furling, it was the majestic document that inspired both contemporaries and posterity. On Monday, July 1st, having tabled the draft of the declaration, Congress resolved itself into a committee of the whole with Benjamin Harrison of Virginia presiding, and that's the man that you are going to see pictured in the video. And he resumed debate on Lee's resolution of independence. And you will see Richard Henry Lee's 
resolution intro introduced in the Congress in the video. John Dickinson made one last effort to delay the decision, arguing that Congress should not declare independence without first securing a foreign alliance and finalizing the Articles of Confederation. You will see his speech on the floor of the Congress in the video today. By the way, everything that you're going to see, every word, every public statement that is made in the videos is verbatim from history. They took no license. They deleted some words, but every word that you hear spoken publicly was actually taken from the historical record. It's very, very accurate. You will hear John Dickinson's speech. John Adams gave the speech in reply to Dixon. We stated in the case for an immediate declaration, you will hear that speech. After a long day of speeches, a vote was taken. As always, each colony cast a single vote. The delegation for each colony, numbering two to seven members, voted among themselves to determine the colony's vote. Pennsylvania and South Carolina voted against declaring independence. The New York delegation lacking permission to vote for independence abstained. Delaware cast no vote because the delegation was split between Thomas McKean, who voted yes, and George Reed, who voted no. The remaining nine delegations voted in favor of independence, which meant that the resolution had been approved by the Committee of the Whole. The next step was for the resolution to be voted upon by Congress itself. You will not see the vote of the resolution of the whole. You will see the vote of the Congress uh, as a whole. Edward Rutledge of South Carolina, who was opposed to Lee's resolution but desirous of unanimity, moved that the vote be postponed until the following day. So, on July the 2nd, South Carolina reversed its position and voted for independence. In the Pennsylvania delegation, Dickinson and Robert Morris abstained, allowing the delegation to vote three to two in favor of independence. The tie in the Delaware delegation was broken by the timely arrival of Caesar Rodney, who voted for independence, and you're going to see that. The last minute entry of, of Mr. Rodney of Delaware, who came in at the last minute to vote yes for the resolution. The resolution of independence had been adopted with 12 affirmative votes and one abstention. You'll see that. It was New York. With this, the colonies had officially severed political ties with Great Britain. In a now famous letter written to his wife on the following day, John Adams predicted that July 2nd would become a great American holiday. Adams thought that the vote for independence would be commemorated July 2nd. He did not foresee that Americans, including himself later, would instead celebrate Independence Day on the date that the announcement of the act was finalized on July 4th and signed by the President of the Congress alone, John Hancock. By the way, you will see depicted the letter that John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail. After voting in favor of the resolution of independence, Congress turned its attention to the committee's draft of the, Revol of the Declaration. Over several days of debate, Congress made a few changes in wording and deleted nearly a fourth of the text, most, most notably passage critical to slave trade, changes that Jefferson resented. On July 4th, 1776, the wording of the Declaration of Independence was approved and sent to the printer for publication. What we're going to show is excerpts that I have personally edited and compiled, put together in, in this video format, which was taken from the outstanding series that was called simply John Adams. So if you would like to get the full video of what you're going to see today in excerpted form, I strongly recommend you go find, go to Amazon, go to a store, go somewhere and buy. It's a series of videos on the life of John Adams. The video focuses on Adams, Franklin, and Jefferson. Jefferson. 
Again, every public statement that is that you hear is historically accurate. We're going to start with a private conversation between General George Washington and George Washington discussing independence. Then the focus is going to shift to the Congress and its debate of and over and its resolution and then finally the actual vote on the floor of the Congress for the resolution to separate from Great Britain. You are going to see the public reading of the Declaration for the very first time that took place. And then you're going to fast forward from 1776 to 1789 after the war for independence had been achieved, you are going to witness the first inauguration of President George Washington as he is sworn in as America's very first president. And every word is accurate. And everything he did in this video presentation is accurate with every historical record that I have ever read. It's about 23 minutes long. Please keep your children still and quiet. We had to kind of rig the, the technology to make this work. And there are times whenever they're, they are speaking softly in whispers. And we will not be able to turn the volume up too much without getting a lot of feedback. So you'll need to listen carefully at those moments. To those of you on the Internet, we have to say goodbye. May God give you a very wonderful, happy, and rich Independence Day on Wednesday. We thank God for all of you in our extended Liberty Fellowship family throughout the United States. We love you very much. I'm sorry we can't show you the video. Go get the video for yourself. John Adams, and you can see it uh, for yourself. It's what you should do anyway. So we'll see you, God willing. We'll see you next Sunday.